Come grab a seat. Pauline said I should be teaching in Vegas, and there's going to be something to this, so you just got to wait. <clears throat> grab your seats. Feel free to spread out. Um, I, well, I'll tell you in a minute. Taryn is bringing a new inductive study Bible in here that they found on the floor on Sunday. So I don't know if one of you ladies left your Bible here on Sunday, but you probably want it. <clears throat> are we missing groups? Or are we all here? Hey, Tinica. All right, welcome here. How was your first week of homework? So long. I was saying to my group, I think the longest I've ever done. I have done the first four lessons of Acts, and I don't think any of them are that long. But it kind of felt like you kept turning the page. And like when, not that I need the Bible study to end, but when is this going to end? There's a lot of cross-references. <clears throat> okay, so Taryn is going to bring a Bible in here. Every lady, grab your seat. Uh, yeah, welcome here. Okay, here is someone's Bible. It's the ESV version. <clears throat> if it's yours, you were at the Northview Women's Worship Night. And on March 24th, 2020, you got saved. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> anyway, this is a Bible that belongs to someone, so if it's yours, we'd love you to have it back. <clears throat> um, okay. We are still needing a couple of volunteers for slides, so if you have any interest at all, we would love if you would talk to us. It would just be like one or two times a term, probably, uh, but it would help Heather be able to be in here. Um, so that would be huge. You don't have to have any tech knowledge at all. Okay, so for those of you who have studied with us a few years, I generally do like a wardrobe theme, depending on what we're studying. So for Daniel, <laughs> it was leopards. Uh, and then for Hebrews, it was athleisure for rest. <laughs> and I have decided for Acts to go with a charismatic theme. <laughs> so I just feel like though this will be too distracting for when I'm actually teaching. <laughs> so I'm wondering if this one will be better. <laughs> Maybe this is for next week when the Holy Spirit descends. I do, though, I will say I felt prompted. We're talking about Jesus' ascension, and I can't be all glittery for that. But I will be for the rest of the time. Um, if you are new here and you think I'm crazy, I kind of am. But, you know, anything to help you learn better. Okay. Question for you. What did your family or you do on December 25th, 2020? What is December 25th? Oh, okay. What'd you do? Do you remember? What about Easter Sunday, 2021? Is there a special meal you have as a family? Something you do? Is that Ashley Tear? Hello. Um, okay, so how about Thursday, May 13th of this year? Do you remember? It was Ascension Day. Did you not mark it in some special way? Why not? So we know his birth. We celebrate his incarnation at Christmas. We celebrate Christ's death on Good Friday. Uh, and we celebrate his resurrection on Easter. But we do nothing with his Ascension. Why not? Why not? 
Mark May 26, 2022 in your calendar. Because we're going to do something. And I hope that studying the book of Acts changes forever how we celebrate Ascension Day, which is actually quite a holiday um, in Europe. And uh, Pentecost Sunday, too. What did you do last year? Anything? Because it's interesting that we will take his incarnation, his crucifixion, his resurrection, all the very human experiences that he has on earth, and we really value and treasure those. Uh, And so tonight, I actually just want to unpack the doctrine of the ascension so that it changes something in us and so that we look at him and know him in a different way And so that also when Ascension Day comes around next year, we know what it means and we know the significance of it. So I'm going to pray. We're going to get started. Father, thank you for all these women that you have appointed uh, to study the book of Acts. You already know what you want to do in us. And I just pray, Father, that we would have soft enough hearts uh, and a submissive spirit to you and your will that you would give us comprehension of the text that helps us to love you more and live for you in a, in, in a better way that makes our life on earth uh, more worth it. Pray that you would meet us in your word tonight and that you would give us a greater hope tonight because of your ascension and what it means in our lives now. In your name, amen. Okay, so again, his birth made Jesus a man. He came from heaven onto earth. He was a human being in the flesh. His his crucifixion conquered the power or conquered the penalty of sin. He paid for our sin on the cross, and so we feel that. We understand that. Easter, when he rose again, he conquered the power of sin over our lives, and he gave us a picture of what one day will happen to us and for us. We will, if we are his children, if we are believers in him, be raised in new bodies. And then 1 Corinthians 15, 14 gives us the bottom line, if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. But what about the ascension? What does the ascension matter? You have a handout, uh, I hope. Um, And so really, I love to teach, and I love to teach doctrine and theology. And so for the first couple weeks anyway, Acts is so packed with essential doctrines and things that we need to know as believers. And yet most of us don't understand the the significance of the ascension, perhaps. I, I certainly didn't. Um, until I was in my systematic theology class um, and studying what it means for the believer. So we're going to look at four Ps tonight, actually. And I am realizing, as I'm getting to know how to make these uh, sheets on the Preach TV, I recognize my font is too small for tonight, so I'm going to try stretch it out and make it bigger, but it may be a bit of a struggle tonight. So we're going to see why does the ascension matter. Our perspective shifts is going to be the first thing we're going to look at. Our perspective shifts. Our power changes. Oops, sorry. That's going to be number two. Uh, Our perseverance is strengthened because of the ascension. And his presence is nearer, though he is farther. Okay, so our perspective shifts, our power changes. This is why the ascension matters for us believers today. Our perseverance is strengthened, and his presence is nearer, though he is farther. So first, the facts. We first read in Acts chapter 1 that Jesus ministered for 40 days after his resurrection. So there's 40 days between his resurrection and his ascension. Um, And there are three things to kind of describe what he did. He convinced 
the disciples that he was physically resurrected. He needed to convince them. And we talked about this in our class. Why did he need 40 days to do that? Well, because many eyewitnesses would be needed to prove that he actually existed and that he actually was resurrected. There are two historians, Eusebius and Josephus, and they're really the only two men who had eyewitness accounts and who had reports who were able to write church history of the first couple hundred years. And it was important that Jesus convinced those that saw him in those first 40 days that he had a physical bodily resurrection. Number two, he commanded the disciples. He gave them commands. He gave them instructions. And the big one was he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem until the gift from the Father was given to them. So he convinced them, he commanded them, and then he corrected a lot of misunderstandings about the kingdom. And it was interesting to see, I think it was in verse three, where it said he taught many things concerning the kingdom. Um, And then later on, the disciples are like, well, when are you going to, like, they're still seeing him as this deliverer from Rome. When are you going to give us the kingdom back? When will the Jews, when will Israel get the kingdom back? And he's like, you don't understand. But power will come on you, will be given to you, and the Holy Spirit comes on you to be my witnesses to Judea, Samaria, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. That's the kingdom of God. That's what you need to know right now. I still misunderstand very many things about the kingdom. And I wonder for myself, when will you do this? Why haven't you done this? Why haven't you fixed this? And he's like, Angie, it's not for you to know when or why or how. But you do have the power to be my witness. And that's what you need to know. Okay, so let's look at the basics of his ascension to start. We're going to look at some passages. You don't have them there, and I am just sad that I feel like these are going to be too small because we've got a lot of them to go through. Okay, so Acts 1-9, let's just get the basics. We studied this one today. After he said these things, he was lifted up. While they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. That's way too small. I'm sorry. I'll read it to you as we go. Luke 24, 50 to 51, while he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. So in Acts, we don't get that part, that he's carried up into heaven. Mark 16, 19 says the same thing. So the Lord Jesus, after he'd spoken to them, was taken up into heaven, and then he gives us more, and he sat down at the right hand of God. So this brings up an interesting question. What is heaven and where is heaven? Because Jesus' physical human body is somewhere. He doesn't become a spiritual being just because he's ascended into heaven. So there's this spatial reality that his physical body is taking up a space somewhere. And we're talking in our group too about kind of the Sunday school flannel graphs that probably don't always give us the best picture of uh, the life of Christ, like his ascension. Like we always have this picture of him uh, in white glowing robes uh, being carried up on a cloud. And it doesn't seem like it was that uh, glorious an event. He just went. He just parted. So let's unpack heaven a little bit more. Uh, John 16, 28, he says, I came forth from the Father and have come into the world. I am leaving the world again and going to the Father. So where is heaven? It's where the Father is. If we're connecting these passages we've just read, he's gone back into heaven. He came from the Father and now he's gone back. John 7, 33, therefore Jesus said, for a little while longer I'm with you and then I go to him who sent me. And then John 6, 62, what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? So we do know that in his incarnation, in his becoming a baby born on the earth, he came from heaven. He came from the presence of God. Uh, So this place idea has implications for our views of uh, where heaven is and what it means. Um, The ascended body of Jesus has been adapted to a heavenly habitation, 
and it's what our bodies will be adapted to as well. And I'm just going to read a quote here. Christ Jesus, the man, is in heaven with God still incarnate in a spiritual body yet in a realm beyond our perception. Christ Jesus is in heaven, still fully human and still fully God. Why does that matter? I'm going to read you one other quote because this, uh, I, I just loved this. A body necessarily occupies space. So the spatial distinction is not merely metaphor, but a reality. There's a place where the human Jesus is. There is a heaven in which spiritual bodies occupy space, a created realm in which creatures are to the limits of their capacity in the immediate presence of God. Of course, we're beyond the limits of language here, beyond the three-dimensional thinking of our world. What matters is that we hold together the reality that Jesus remains enfleshed, in a glorified, transformed body with the reality that where he is is a realm beyond our perceptions, beyond our understanding of space and time, yet in the presence of God, who is as near as our next breath. Like, I don't want to go totally anti-whatever here, but... Like, we don't know where heaven is. But we read in Daniel 10 this war between the spiritual, like the heavenlies, that is actually taking place right before Daniel, like in the area that he is living in. And it's just interesting to think, like Jesus is in flesh, he is in his human body, taking space somewhere in a spiritual realm. And I just had this thought of like, I think it's so much closer than we imagine. We have this idea of him ascending into heaven. It must be so far away, or we're living among it. The ascension represents the departing of the incarnate son back to the place where God is, taking human nature where it has never gone before, but we will someday. So let's deal with our four Ps. Our perspective shifts. 1 Peter 3, 21 to 22. Christ, who's at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers had been subjected to him. He has been raised to heaven where every angel, authority, and power had been subjected to him. Ephesians 1, 19 to 20. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what's the hope of his calling, what are the riches of his glory, of his inheritance in the saints, what's the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, wherever those are far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that's named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he's put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. I'm sad these are small. Colossians 3, 1. Therefore, if you have been raised with Christ... Keep seeking the things above, where Jesus is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind, set your thinking on the things above, not on the things that are on earth, for you've died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you'll also be revealed with him in glory. So there's a couple terms, actually. We see Christ coming to earth as a baby, his incarnation. When he ascends into heaven, it's called his glorification. It is his final, like, final dwelling, the way that he will dwell. It's also considered in theological terms when he lived on earth, his humiliation, when he ascended to God, his exaltation, that God exalted him. And it is often said that while he is in heaven, he continues three ministries. He is the perfect prophet, 
who is still speaking today through his word. He is the priest who is ministering, and we're going to dig into that in a little bit. And he is the king who is reigning over every power and authority. I think this is a critical thing. We kind of see Jesus as resurrected, and in our human minds, his life on earth is done, which means he's kind of apart from us. But he is ministering to us today. He is ministering at the right hand of God. So, two things here. Your life is presently hidden with Christ in God where he is presently seated, and you will also be with him in glory one day. So then uh, Colossians 3 continues. um, Therefore, then consider, so think about the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, all these things. So he's saying, if you are seated with Christ, if you are hidden in him, you actually have some degree as well of power and authority and power subjected to you. So he's exalted and glorified by his Father. We are united with him, which is a foreshadow to where we really will live for all time. And our union with him to some degree means that we are with him now. He has authority and power and honor. He's the head of the church. He is then the giver of spiritual gifts. So we dwell with him now. We will live with him fully. John Calvin says this, he passed through where no man has ever gone as the second Adam, and Hebrews 9, 11 confirms that for us. Jesus once asked the disciples what they might do if they saw the Son of Man ascend into heaven, and Peter, of course, responds, well, Lord, to whom shall we go? You're the one who has the words of eternal life. So, ladies, when we started, when we studied precept, um, or (laughs) Hebrews, uh, 4, 14 to 16, since then we have a great high priest who's passed through the heavens. Let us with confidence draw near the throne of grace. We have to consider ourselves as hidden in him, as living with him, as present with him, and it changes how we draw near God's throne. So the same is true for you and me. Where else can we go but run to the throne of grace, to Jesus who is seated in the presence of God? Okay, so his incarnation shows us that he became like us. His resurrection shows us that we will become like him. And his ascension shows us that where he is, we will be. The ascension means that God's people are, in a manner of speaking, already in heaven. We set our minds on the things above because our lives are hidden with Christ who dwells above. So what should our response be to the doctrine of the ascension? It should impact our thinking. We should picture ourselves hidden with him. We should picture our future as glorified with him uh, forever. Hey, next thing, our power changes. Philippians 2.9, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. And 1 Timothy 6.15, he who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And actually, Paul, I didn't have it in before this, but he's describing who Christ is at his ascension. So Jesus in ascending is exalted by his father. He is called the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Um, and our king gives really good gifts to his people in his kingdom, and he gives gifts of power. So in Acts 2.33, we're going to dig into here next week. Why isn't this working? Don't know, but this isn't good. One sec. All right. I don't know what to do, so I'll just keep reading you Bible verses. Um, Okay, so Acts 2.33, we're going to get there next week. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God, so after having ascended and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, do I need to move, Heather? I'm good, okay. Uh, Where am I? Having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you see and hear. The ascension is necessary to the sending of the Spirit. The sending of the Spirit would not have happened 
had Christ not ascended. So the disciples did not like hearing that he was going to leave them. In John 16, six to seven, he says, because I've said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I don't go away, the helper won't come to you. But if I do go, I'll send him to you. So I don't know if we always fully think through this. If Jesus had stayed on earth after his resurrection, he, he made himself known over a period of 40 days to how many people? Probably a few hundred. Um, restricted by the, to the limits of human voice and ears. The ones who could intimately speak with him or be embraced by him would be even fewer. But in ascending, Jesus didn't lose his human body but he's able to relate to an unlimited number of people through the pouring out of his spirit. Uh, John Calvin said it this way, which Institutes of the Christian Religion sounds like a super dry read. It is not. It's so good. Like maybe in a modern version. (laughs) It's good. Christ left us in such a way that his presence might be more useful to us. A presence that had been confined in a humble abode of flesh so long as he sojourned on earth is now, and we're gonna see next week what it actually is, but it's his spirit poured out on and in every believer. So what does the pouring out of the spirit do? Well, number one, it seals and it guards. He seals and guards. Ephesians 1.13 tell us that we're sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. He's given us a pledge of an inheritance. He has given us a pledge that we will be redeemed and glorified one day. Number two, he gives spiritual gifts. So Ephesians 4, 8 says, when he ascended on high, he gave gifts to men. Some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists. Number three, he empowers. He empowers us to not sin. He empowers us to obey, and he empowers us to be witnesses for him. So he gives power for ministry and work in the kingdom. I think the whole book of Acts is going to be actually answering that question the disciples asked. What is the kingdom of God? When is it coming? When are you going to give it to us? Like, I think we're going to get those answers. So what is this power? This is one of my favorite words in the entire Greek New Testament. It is dunamis power or dunamis power. It is a supernatural power. It's used over 200 times in the New Testament. Um, But in Ephesians 1.18, listen to what Paul says. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he's called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance and his holy people, and his incomparably great dunamis power for us who believe. That power is the same mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. That is the power the Holy Spirit poured out onto us. Here Paul says that the power by which God raised Christ from the dead is the same power at work in us. I don't know if we generally comprehend that fully. The same power that raised Christ from the dead is the same power working in you to conquer sin, to obey him, to witness but we always kind of take it down to our inadequacies and our inabilities. But it's not about us. It's about believing the power that he gave us. Romans 8, 11 says, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will give you life to your mortal bodies according to the spirit who dwells in you. Um, Romans Hebrews 11, 11, this is one of my favorite ones. By faith, Sarah, 90 years old, received the dunamis power to conceive. So an impossible resurrection of Jesus, an impossible pregnancy for a 90-year-old woman, this is the power imparted to us to do his goodwill. And then Colossians 1, 28 to 29, Paul says... For this purpose I labor, like to present you complete in Christ one day, striving according to his power, 
which dunamis works within me. The ministry we do, the discipling that we do, is all according to his great power, or it won't happen. Or we'll feel exhausted, or we'll feel useless. Like there is something important to know that his ascension has made it possible that we live by that same power and with that same power. And we wouldn't have it had he not ascended. So power over sin, power to obey, power to minister. We're sealed, given gifts to minister and witness and serve the church. None of this had Christ not ascended. Number three, our perseverance. I'm going to see if this is working yet. It is not... I'm going to do handouts next time instead of technology. Okay, so Christ's ascension helps us to persevere. A few reasons. He passed through. He gives us hope that one day we will pass through to glory, that we will be in the presence of God, that we will be in the presence of Christ in new bodies with no more pain, no more sorrow, no more disease, no more grieving. So Hebrews 4.14 says, Since then we have a great high priest who's passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let's hold fast our confession. The writer of Hebrews is telling us the fact that he ascended is power for your perseverance. Second, he finished his work on earth and is still working in heaven. Hebrews 1.3, he upholds the universe by the word of his power. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, which means he had finished his priestly consecrating work in us to save us, but he's still working now. There, one author put it this way, he is still in skin. Dust sits on the throne. We don't have a high priest who can't sympathize with our weakness. He's still in skin. But one who's been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin, so let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. Because he's still in skin. He understands every temptation and affliction. He's our representative in heaven. He is still incarnate. He is flesh in heaven. Jesus is the one man who lived out perfectly every day of his life, the image of God in a human being. Uh, The final picture we have is a radiant Jesus ascending into heaven. Finally, he intercedes for us and is working for us right now. This is his ministry right now. So we often read the Gospels. We have his ministry on earth. We see what he said and did. He is ministering now. He serves as our mediator. He is making a constant connection for us as our brother in the presence of our Father. Joined forever to our humanity. Hebrews 7.25, he's able to save forever those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. He's always praying for you. He is praying that you would have strength when temptation comes. He is praying that you would persevere in your faith. He is praying that we would be unified as sisters and churches. And then, John 14, 2-3, what else is his ministry? He's getting us a room ready. He's doing that right now. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it weren't so, I wouldn't have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I'm going to come again and get you and bring you home. Finally, he's coming back. That helps our perseverance. He's coming back just like he left which means he's coming back in flesh. He's coming back in a bodily coming. But Revelation 1-7, he's coming with the clouds and every eye will see him. So the ascension, we shouldn't see it primarily as a conclusion to Christ's life and ministry, but as a beginning of a different ministry of his. Lived out in a different way, giving us different power and ability to live. So his presence is nearer, even though he's farther. So he, he, he lives in flesh still. He stays wedded to our humanity. And through this, he affirms that he loves humanity. 
he is still concerned about flesh and blood humans. He didn't drop our humanity from himself. And I don't know if we've thought about that much, or maybe even that idea offends you that he is still in skin in heaven. I think sometimes we have, or I have had in the past, just a really different idea about who he is. But I think there's a reason he is still in flesh in heaven, that we can truly know that he understands every affliction and temptation. <clears throat> so he left his more useful presence with every believer all the time, and this is going to mean greater advancement for his kingdom, and we're going to see that work out in the book of Acts. So Matthew 28, 19 to 20, he said, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you, and lo, I am with you always to the end of your life. His physical presence is farther but his presence is within us so much nearer. And although maybe sometimes we don't see the benefit of it and we think that it would just be so much better if we were with him, if he still lived on the earth, we've got to believe what he says. He said it would be, it's better for you that I go so I can pour out my spirit for you. Romans 8, 26. In the same way, the spirit also helps our weakness for we don't know how to pray as we should. But the Spirit intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. He who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So the ascension is vital to our hope and to our mission. Jesus is still in skin. He's not dropped us. So I'm going to wrap up kind of the importance of the ascension, and Kevin DeYoung does this in four really great short points. First, the ascension means that we have an advocate with the Father. He opened the way into God's presence that has been closed since the fall. He is the second Adam entering into the presence of God. No other human has done it but him, and he's paving the way for us. Second, the ascension means that God's people are, in a manner of speaking, already in heaven. Like Colossians showed us, we set our minds on the things above because our lives are hidden with Christ in God. We fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. Third, the ascension means we can receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, that we can be empowered to minister once ascended to heaven, Jesus sent another helper, and we're going to read the whole story of that in chapter 2. To give us power from on high, that was a purpose, to give us a helper, to give us a comforter, to give us an advocate, to give us an illuminator to help us understand the scriptures, and he'll be with us forever. He, is seal he seals us until the day of our redemption, until the day of our resurrection and our glorification. Fourth, the ascension means that human flesh sits enthroned in heaven, God has granted all power and authority to a man. And Jesus Christ is exercising the dominion that human beings were made to have from the beginning. The ruin of the first Adam is being undone by the reign of the second who's still in skin. Because of Christ's ascension, we know that the resurrection is real. The incarnation continues, that Christ's humanity lives on in heaven, that the spirit of Jesus can live in our hearts, and a flesh and blood divine human being rules the universe. So what difference does Christ's ascension make in your life? How will May 26, 2022 look different than May 13th, 2021? How will the doctrine of the ascension impact your daily walk? So there's a couple questions on the bottom here, and I'll get actually Crystal to come up. If you can even just start, I don't know, playing something. And we'll take some time with this. So we don't just walk away. We have like a few verses on the ascension of Jesus. But it actually means so much to our daily walk. So... 
Lord, show me how the ascension of Christ applies to me personally. And we talked last week about how application gets worked out. It gets worked out in my head. Maybe I need to think differently about something. For me, certainly it was that, what difference does it make that he's still in flesh in heaven, that he's still a man? I need to think differently about that. I need to think of myself dwelling with him and hidden with him. You can play it, and then I'll get them to fill this out. And then maybe what difference does it need to make in my heart? Is there an assurance that I have now that he lives interceding for me? Or do I need to do something because of this? Let's just take two minutes. Uh, Just ask him how he can apply the reality of his ascension to your life and give you hope or comfort. And then we're going to worship. I think so often that we often think of Christ or refer to him in terms of what he has done for us. He died for us. He rose for us. It accomplished these things. But I don't know that I think enough on what he's doing for me right now and what he's doing for his church right now uh, and what he has left us in order to help us live for him. And so we're going to uncover that next week in our study. Uh, We'll be praying for you as you dig into the text again. Um, and pray that it is a really exciting um, and enlightening time in terms of your walk with him. So let's pray for you. Father, thank you for these women. Thank you for time in your word in the last two hours, and I pray that you would um, just keep it with us, keep us meditating on some aspect of it that you know you want to minister to us with or change us, change our thinking, comfort us, uh, reassure us, And Lord, would we just um, have this sense that you are near, that we can't understand this this idea of heaven and where it is, um, but you are intimately involved in our lives and praying for every aspect of them. We love you, and we want to know you and love you more. Would you help us? In your name, amen. Have a great week.